I can only make about four steps forward before I touch the door. And if I turn in an about face at any place in this cell, I'm going to bump into something. I'm in the cell for 23 hours a day. I'm used to it, and that's one of the bad things about it. I know there's exactly five inches of space between the edge of Herman's toilet and his wall, and I know everything about that cell right now. timeline that you got married in 1963? Of course I don't have a problem with that. Okay, cool. Dates of your brothers and sisters' births. What number are you? What number am I? I am the fourth child. You're the fourth out of how many? Twelve, right? No, baby, nine. <laughs> <laughs> you just, are you testing my <laughs> The seven, twelve. You should have said seventeen. about how intimidated she was in order to write me. Now I'm saying, here, I'm a damn prisoner in a cage locked up with the keys on the way. She was in her 20s at the time. When she put symptoms, it's a sickness. When I first seen the pictures, to me, it was garbage. And I'm wondering, what in the hell is she sending me these pictures for? But then when I read the letter, then it had significance. It was something that what she was doing, you know, in order to say, hey, look, this is the first thing that I set my eyes on for every hour on an hour. I would show you how things were with me out here, you know, in comparison with what life is for you. I know people do crazy things, you know. And that was crazy, but it was it was special because it was crazily done for me. So I immediately respond back to her, and it just kicked off from this. When I first started to visit him, he was in the dungeon, and it was two metal screens that were askew, so I you couldn't see. All you could see was like kind of like a, a silhouette moving. But what was really remarkable was I had tiny, tiny braids in my hair, really small. And he was like, are those plaits in your hair? And uh, I was like, yeah. He could actually see these, this tiny, tiny detail on the top of my hair, which people who were talking to me barely noticed. <laughs> Breakfast 
And shortly after I started writing Herman, he went into this cell, which is the dungeon, which is a lot more punitive. Um, and it was during that time that I started to see him dilapidate, you know, and to suffer. And so I knew that the only way, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not rich, you know, and I'm not powerful, but I'm an artist. And I knew that the only way I could get him out of prison was to get him to dream. And that was where this project began. Um, I asked Herman, what kind of house do you dream of after spending 30 years in prison? I mean, what kind of house do a, a man is out there uh, dream about? I don't dream about no house. Being out there in the streets, uh, even if I was homeless, I was satisfied. He said, all right, Jackie, I'll play. I'll play your game. Jackie sent me a great deal of, of houses. The houses look like um, lighthouses and stuff, houses in the trees and all of this. And I'm thinking that if this is what people out in the streets are living in, there's something wrong with uh, the mentality, the psyche of the people in the street. And so uh, I took this house and I improvised upon that. And I kept changing it and changing it and changing it until I perfected it to the way that I wanted. It turned out a whole lot better than what I ever dreamed it was. In fact, it's probably the best move that I made in my life. Well, Herman, I have to tell you, I'm moving quite a bit. I just met with the gallery today. They gave us a bigger space in the gallery. So that's kind of exciting. Ta-da. Awesome. It's crazy. It's really crazy. We feel like the shit that he asked for, like, so specific. Like, w after I built out the kitchen, you'll see on this little CAD model, it's like a video, but the model itself makes this ideal, like, idealized house. And he asked, um, he asked that the kitchen, he's like, oh, the kitchen looks really great. I you know, wanted it yellow, which is like totally 70s. He's been in solitary since 1972. But uh, he wanted the kitchen totally yellow. And he was looking at these photos, and he's like, it looks great, but can you please put uh, sprinklers in the ceiling so that it's safe for cooking? <laughs> Jackie, in your letter, you asked me what sort of house does a man who live in a six foot by nine foot cell dream of? In the front of the house, I have three squares of gardens. The gardens are the easiest for me to imagine, and I can see they would be certain to be full of gardenias, carnations, and tulips. This is of the utmost importance. I would like for guests to be able to smile and walk through flowers all year long. On the wall shared with the kitchen is the wall of revolutionary fame. I would like to see three to five portraits with these revolutionaries, such as Abel Prosper, Ben Malvesi, Matt Turner, John Brown, and of course, Eric Tuck. And to the upstairs master bedroom, there is a king-size bed, African art, and narrow ceiling. There's a door leading from the master bedroom to the master bed with a six foot by nine foot hot tub. The cell I presently live in is a six feet by eight feet. I would like for you to build me a swimming pool with a large green bottom and a large black top in the center. Jackie is making sure that the house is my idea, that, that the soul of the house comes from my idea and the way I think it should be built. And she's like an engine, you know, as she first told me before, tell me how you want your house built and I'm going to build it.
and it's a really important exchange. The way that he gets to exit the cell uh, through this project through his house, which was my suggestion in the way I enter the cell through this project. I think that the, the best activism is equal parts love and equal parts anger. And I think all of my work is generated from some source of frustration or anger. It has to be a point of anger that pushes you to do something. And if it's just anger, I, it's not rich. But if it's anger and love, then you have a chance of it, of it actually affecting somebody else besides yourself. The No Bush Project, that was well before Herman's House, and that came out of me on the BART in San Francisco reading this, this, the headlines were that Lucy Liu is the new sexiest woman in Hollywood, and then there's this tiny little paragraph about Bush's first action in office. So after the coup in 2000, the first thing he did on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade was reinstate the Mexico City policy, Mexico City ban, which is funding to Planned Parenthoods around the world that offer abortion counseling or services. And I was frustrated and irritated and I just like wrote an email to a friend and said, we have to do something. So this is a call to arms, we should shave our bush and send it to them. The next thing you know, I had like 486 bags of pubic hair from different women around the world which was pretty disgusting. And my mom and I brought them to DC and marched with them in a pro-choice rally. It had sensationalism, sex, raunchiness, pubic hair, the reference to vagina, all that And so that's easy for people to listen to. when my mom got sick. And then we were supposed to have our first exhibition of the house that Herman built. I think it was like two months after she was diagnosed with cancer and he said, your most important thing is your mother. And that's when I, I told Jackie, you know, she had to take and put this stuff aside, you know, because I was more concerned about her mom than I was about this project, I'm so sorry. I knew she had to take care of her mom. And if she didn't, she would regret it for the rest of her life. And I say that based upon my own self being in prison and not having been able to be there for my own mom. on this bank robber charge. We were, you know, uh, doing a lot of negative man, stuff that I'm not even proud of uh, up to date, you know. And uh, I apologize greatly to um, the things and for the things that I've done. I remember uh, breaking into a school when I was a kid and took some of the instruments, and I think that even to today, you know, how it haunts me uh, for having done that, because there was kids who were taking music lessons and stuff, and the only thing I wanted to do was, was to take stuff from someone else. I come to prison when I was 25 years old. Could you imagine the time that I've lost? Sugar. 
My name is Victory Wallace. I'm Herman Wallace's sister. Today is his birthday. I'm going to get some stuff for him so we can make some cookies and cakes. Now I'm looking for the cake mix. OK, we need the chocolates. Yeah, this, this ought to be enough. OK, over here, that's my little baby sister who recently died right behind my mama, Norma Jean. And the other picture over there was me and my, my son and I. That's where he got killed in 86. His best friend had took and killed him for no reason, saying that he took his money when he didn't take it. This is my dad, my mother, and my stepfather. This brother, I don't class as my stepfather. I class him as my real daddy. He don't visit nobody in jail. He don't like jailhouses. You feel to believe you shouldn't have been in there. What you went in there for, you didn't have to do what you did. You know, regardless if he was out of work, you know. He felt to believe he wasn't supposed to go and rob a bank. That's what I remember that. That's one of them old pictures of him when he first went to the jail. I've been going out there for 40 or 40 some years. Maybe, I think more than that, if I can recall, more than that. It's not uh, political, you know, and that's understandable. She's an ordinary uh, single single mom, and um, basically because of me, you know, she has visited with me in order to keep my strength going, you know, and I can't say enough about Vicky. She's a wonderful mother and a wonderful sister. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. In April 1972, a corrections officer was brutally murdered at Louisiana's Angola prison. Two inmates were convicted of the crime. They spent 36 years in solitary confinement. Widow Teeny Verrett, only 17 years old back then, was a newlywed. Her husband, Brent Miller, had just been stabbed 32 times. She says the prison warden convinced her the two inmates were guilty. But now, decades later, she's not sure. Why? The murder weapon was never tied to either of them, and a bloody fingerprint at the scene did not match Wallace or Woodfox. What I want is justice, and if these two men, if they did not do this, I think they need to be out. Their lawyers have launched appeals against the convictions based on unreliable inmate testimony. Amnesty International describes their punishment as cruel and unusual in violation of the U.S. Constitution.
sorry. <laughs> together because it took effect on me. But I lost everything when I went and looked at my house and I couldn't accept that. Vicky, yeah. you hear that? I you am. You got a lot to be, you got a lot to be thankful for. You got people that love you, okay? I know. So, um, don't break down on me. You got to hold your head up and keep moving. I'm trying. You're my sister. You're supposed to learn that from me. I'm trying. All right? How does it feel to be back in my house? I'm just doing an interview here. I'm not investing anything emotionally into the house, so I'm just really neutral right now. Ooh.
Well, this is the kitchen, and this table was always full. Like, eating was a big deal for us. <laughs> and we were all really busy kids and really athletic and always had, like, 15 soccer games and baseball games and whatever, but my mom insisted that we always eat dinner together. When you lose someone like your mom, it's all you have, right? And so it's hard, you know, it's a lot of letting go and it's a lot of throwing out and it's a lot of creating space between yourself and objects. Unequivocally, my father hated me for a number of years. So, is unequivocally the right word? So, undeniably, indubitably, my father hated me for a number of years, right? And that was significantly different than the boys. And it was, you know, just because he had problems with women. So what? So, so we didn't really get along. I mean, this was a really violent house. There was a lot of very physical fighting and very horrible things were said. You know, my mom said when she was dying that her greatest regret was that she didn't leave my dad earlier because most of the violence was against me. And I think it's because I was a really headstrong, annoying young woman. I played football because I loved the sport. I loved watching it. I loved everything about it. I enjoyed spending that time with my dad, actually, you know, which was like, w before I could really talk, um, he liked me. And we would spend time watching football. And that was like a big pleasure and I'm sure a big influence. You know, I was 12, I think, when I signed up. I didn't think it was any big deal at all, because I just wanted to play. in itself is to create an environment that would be conducive to kids that are being pushed aside, kids that are being placed in the prisons, in the homes, in the detention. I think it's incumbent upon us who have been there before to put an end to it.
I was a stick up kid. Armed robbery, that's what I went to prison for. I'm not proud of it, but I did it. I'm guilty. I don't believe I should have got what I had gotten. You know, 15, made a mistake. I robbed somebody with a pellet gun. Nobody was hurt. BB gun, that's what I did. You know, and Dana Cummins, this district attorney, she painted me out to be, you know, this horrible monster, throw him away. I got sentenced, you know, sent to Angola, 12 years. How do you take a 15-year-old um, and put him in life, you know, put him in prison for 12 years? I can understand maybe juvenile, and then maybe once he's like 21 or 22, moving him to a facility where there's grown men. Um, because I do believe that if you do something wrong, you have to pay for your crime. I understand that. You getting dropped in a prison full of grown men. You got good people there in prison too, you know? You really do. But everybody in prison is not good, you know? And that's just the guy's honest truth. Some people in prison are better off there. You know, I came to the brink of losing my own sanity where I was just on attack mode, you know? I was mean. Every chance I got, I was gonna get somebody. Being in solitary confinement, the best way that I can explain to anybody that has never been there, go to the pound, your animal shelter, where the dogs are. When you go in there, the dogs go crazy. You know, they're barking, they're growling. You know, some of them are biting at the fence. That's what Camp J is like. You know, it's complete madness. And yet, you know, in the middle of all of this, they got this old guy, you know, this old dude that's just calm. But I'm seeing this guy, and I'm like, man, this guy's been in prison three times my life. Man, how can I, you know, how can I, I, I be like this dude here where he's just at peace? This person named Mr. Wallace, my son started writing to me, and then whenever I would visit him, he'd tell me about a Mr. Hooks, is what they call him. They all have nicknames there. Michael's handwriting improved a lot, greatly. His vocabulary actually changed a lot. And it was because of this man. And he told me that this man put him, took him under his wing and tried to explain to him a new way of being. It was uh, compassion. And that's something a lot of people lose in there, is compassion. I lost it. Just being friends with him and dealing with him every day, you know, for the few years that we were around each other, he walked me through that. He's taught my son a lot. I understand part of what Mr. Hooks is in there for, but I'm personally like this. If anybody can do that in there, what could he do for out here? Strange two words, though, huh? Like real estate. That's be that we're looking at for a virtual home. <laughs> I guess it is pretty special. Um, well, the uh, person who's designing the home mm -hmm. that I'd like to build is a uh, is a prisoner in the penitentiary mm -hmm. in the Angola okay. penitentiary. And so this is actually his dream home. Really? Do you want something closer to the prison? Not necessarily closer. Um, but our greater concern would be the neighbors' reactions. First of all, the prisoner's not going to live there, right? Well, if he's released, he might. But he could live anywhere if he's released. That's okay. correct, yeah. But see, that's the reason, I mean, why would it really matter to anybody if he did? If the house is designed by a prisoner? OK, you're from New York, and yeah. I know people have different, maybe, <laughs> thoughts. But around here, it's almost like, who cares? Uh -huh. <laughs> no offense, but, but no, who yeah. would care? 
If he moved bought the property next to me, I wouldn't care. It gets in my way. You know, you got guns, you know? I mean, heck, I mean, why would it bother anybody? Right. Much of the land that I see here is it's good. But in building the house, it's, you know, in this part of the neck of the woods, it does not serve the purpose for building the house in the first place. Where are the children? I would like for her to take and look into New Orleans. Herman's house is a dream house, and he built it and designed it with anything possible, um, without ever actually predicting that it would be built in the city of New Orleans. So now we have a whole spectrum of complications because of, you know, building ordinances and whatever else in the city. I said, I don't think we can do a pool, an underground pool, and he said, then it is in Herman's house. Figure it out. So we'll figure it out. I mean, maybe it means we have to raise the land first and build the pool down. I'm not really sure. But um, we'll get the property first and then we'll work from there. I'm really intrigued to, to see what, how someone would imagine um, freedom, in, in essence, because that's really what this is. My first reaction is it's so, so bourgeois, but I guess that's the American dream is to have your own uh, your own house and your own uh, plot of land. One, two, three, four, five. I mean, there's there are six rooms that aren't typical rooms, you know? If I was in solitary my whole life, what kind of a house would I think I'd want to live in would be like all glass. I would want to be completely exposed to the outdoors. I would want to be completely open. I wouldn't want any barrier. Somebody wasn't in prison to build their ideal house, it would probably be eight to 10,000 square feet. It would probably have a bowling alley, a media room, I mean, everything. But when you're in solitary confinement, you don't. I mean, you're in a very tight little area all the time. And his house reflects that to me, that every room is, is that way. And you go through a corridor to go from one space to another, but there's no free-flowing no free flowing space here at all. From this house, you cannot see the rising sun. You cannot see the setting sun in that case. It would be actually um, quite... Um, I think oppressive to, to live in this house. You know, as I look at this central room here, this just reminds me of a place, that's, that's like a table with a few different inmates sitting around eating and some benches and so forth around the outside and, and a central kind of cook area. I mean, this looks like a day room in a prison. This house is built in a manner in order to, um, to demonstrate and illustrate what I've been through for the majority of my life. It's been in a cell, in a cage, the majority of my life. I came in a cell at 31 years old, man. I'm 69 now. So, you look at the house you're looking at now. So this is the interior of the house, which is pretty crazy. And I think we're looking at 3,200 square feet altogether. All right. There's a swimming pool. <laughs> here's the site plan. This is what I was looking for. And here's the rain, just in time. I got locked up in 10 out of 15, 1967. I was a rugged kind of guy at that time. And it wasn't until I got involved with, with Panther philosophy, you know, and meeting up with these people, man, that um, I got my whole mind turned around. When the Panthers came on the scene, that made a big difference. That is the greatest contribution that we gain to the black race.
in this country of being proud of who you are. Well, when it comes to Jackie Project, the house that Herman built, they're going to throw every obstacle at their disposal in front of her. You know, we're going to make you work to do this. You ain't going to do nothing to, to honor uh, this nigga that, that we hate. One thing, we hate you because you're down here talking about starting this. You ain't from the South. You're a white girl from New York. You know, you need to take your Yankee ass back to New York. You dig? I'm just telling you that's the way they feel. His spirit is a threat. You know, his whole existence is a threat to those who are who are really stand against peace and justice. Because Herman is the essence of it. Can you imagine building Herman's house in this area, Miss Vicky? Mm-mm. I want to be by me. He been gone so long, I need him by me now. Oh, I'm the sir? only one. In I'm the, the only nine? one. I'm the only one. Everything look different. I ain't been down here in years. That used to be the bar room over there. The bar room? Yeah, Big Jenny. Did you spend a lot of time there? No, we had to go on the side and get it. The white people was in the front, the black people was on the side. Mm. OK. We was living here. So this is the house that you and Herman spent many of your childhood years in, but it used to be split down the middle, like yeah. a shotgun. And y'all were on one side? Yeah. So I'm thinking back of the many things that I was doing in that house. You know, I thought about the times when I used to sit down and, and uh, plait my sister's hair and and iron their dresses, you know, at that time they had King King slips and stuff. And I remember when we first got our television set, it was in 1951. Prior to that, we were listening at uh, the Joe Lewis fight on radio and stuff. And that was a really high, a high mark within the black community, you know, cheering for this black man, you know, to, to beat this German. But I thought that neighborhood was the only place in the world. I didn't venture outside of that, that community um, because mostly the surrounding areas was white orientated, okay? And I went back into them days. You know, I kind of got a bit emotional about it, but it let me know how far we come. Can you read that from here? What? 4229? No, 813-42. Why y'all won't put him on the corner where my mother got hit by this school? It's not that I want to put him there. It's that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to find as many options as possible. Oh, OK. Do I have your permission? No. I thought you said you love me. I do love you, Jackie. I'm your friend, too. Yeah, you're my bosom bosom. We're family now. Nothing but family, huh? <laughs> really weird looking, crazy mixed up family. No. Well, I was um, representing a man named Curtis Kyles. We were preparing for the third trial, and I received a letter from Herman Wallace, who told me uh, he had some information that was helpful to Curtis, and uh, to come see him at Angola. Herman then told me, I know that your client is innocent, because my nephew confessed to me that he killed the woman. And 
uh, this is obviously quite surprising uh, to hear. And he also said, I will probably lose the support of my sister, Beanie's mother. Beanie Wallace was dead at the time we went to trial, but Herman's sister was still upset at the allegations we were making. And I recall then saying, well, Mr. Wallace, I'm not here to cause you any trouble. And uh, I, I'm not going to subpoena you to take the stand uh, because of the problems this will cause to you. And he looked me square in the eye and he said, I expect you to put me on the stand. And I said, why? You just told me what you have to lose. And he said, it's simple. It's the right thing to do. Four years later from the meeting of, of Herman, then I was asked to represent Herman Wallace and I jumped at the chance because uh, it was the right thing to do. He was uh, in, in denial at the time, you know, because he was uh, a son, and you know how, how mothers are about their children. He said, well, you ain't no longer my brother, and this kind of stuff. You know, I'm sorry. I understood that, you know. I really did. Once all of this was over with, because he never uh, abandoned me, you know. It was just how you move to me. And she's there with that. And even just with this day, you know, she's even more there now than ever before. Our research shows nobody in the country has been in solitary confinement longer than Herman and Albert. There's a, a review board, quote unquote, that every 90 days sits down and decides whether they should be released from solitary confinement. And each time, every 90 days, that they've said no. And each time on the slip where they deny the movement, they say, for reasons of initial confinement, basically saying, because you killed a guard, because you're convicted of killing a guard, you cannot be released. When you keep a man locked up because of the crime they committed, well, then that's no review. Um, I'm looking to buy some property probably in this area. I was wondering if you knew who owned that plot of land over there. Well, the church owned that lot. Oh, it does. That huh? church owned that lot. Across the street? Yeah. Um, so, what I'm doing is I work with some prisoners in Angola. And um, one of the prisoners has been in solitary confinement. I'm trying to build his dream home after spending 36 years in solitary confinement. 36 years in confinement, we wouldn't know how to live out there anyway. Well, he's going to have to learn, isn't he? Well, it all depends on the situation that he was there for. That's true, but solitary confinement for 30 years is cruel and unusual punishment. No, it's not. Come on, mister. You had to do something to get there. Six foot by nine foot You know what the law, you broke it. So? You just got to live with it. Because if I like it or not, I still got to live with it. I'm not asking to, like, eradicate prisons or anything like that. I just think that solitary confinement is for 30 years is cruel no, and unusual. No, Absolutely. No, Man, it's no. a six foot by nine foot cell. It's about the size I of your agree bathroom. With that. It's the back of your truck. I know that too. 30 years. Yeah. You had to do something to get there from the beginning. They were Black Panthers who so organized. What? I don't believe in the Black Panthers. I came up with them. I don't like them. And I never would join none of them. You and the laws are already on the books. Because they're still there. They never took them all. But do you think they're applied fairly, the laws? No. They're not. No. And that's what the Black Panthers no. stood up against. Yeah, Those but they were laws wasn't, that are not applied they fairly. They were fighting for how old are you? 35. You know nothing about it. We're looking at the same thing, but we see different. Yeah, we're about. looking at 2.3 million people behind bars. Because they're supposed to be there. No, that's where we're different. 
All right, well, you take care of yourself. Good luck with your breaks. Why everybody don't want to talk about Jill? Why they can't talk about other things? Like breaks? Good start. Someday I'll come back here and I'll talk Good to you about Good start. Breaks. Okay, I need to know whether or not if you found anything uh, that come close to what we are looking for. In I'll tell you that I did. Uh huh. This is the issue. I need to find two shotgun plots next to each other because the house you want is really big. But listen, I'm looking. Okay, I'm going to trust what? your eye, girl. You hear me? I hear you, but I need help. <laughs> I need help. I'm doing this by myself, Herman. I need help. I've never I know. Before, you know. I, I know. Look, you, you, you're doing good. You know, trust your instincts. All right? So all of this is good, and I welcome the challenge. So, you know, just do the best you can. How the f*** are you so positive and you've spent the last 35 years in a solitary confinement cell? Penitentiaries were invented in, I guess, in England in the, in, the, in the Enlightenment era and here as places where people did penance for their sins. And the Eastern States Penitentiary, for, for instance, outside Philadelphia is a giant facility that was designed as huge, a huge star-shaped group of individual isolation cells where people were kept away from anyone except God. And they were supposed to contemplate the error of their ways and turn their lives around. And of course, they mostly went mad. You know, I think our job as an architect is definitely to push and, um, you know, to ensure that spaces have some sense of humanity and dignity. And, um, I mean, that's definitely our job. I mean, definitely. And, and unfortunately, the solitary confinement cell, you know, doesn't have a lot of that. It's very basic. I found this lot looking at a Google map to see where there was more than three or more lots together that didn't have anything on it, um, thinking that would be the path of least resistance. And this one is right downtown. This is the seventh ward. Um, and it's huge. It's actually five lots, three and a double. Um, that the city owns all of it. And it's really beautiful. And it's clear. And it's ideal. And the neighborhood is beaten to So it could certainly stand stand having Herman's house in it, you know? Stand having a big old community state space and stand having like a catalyst for change. And I think Herman would love it.
place. <laughs> so you, get the, you made the right choice, bro. <laughs> so hey, bro, when y'all get out, <laughs> I'm definitely going to take me on vacation. <laughs> Meeting Robert King revolutionized my life, you know, and simply because he was so human and so accessible, despite all of the reasons he shouldn't be. And then through him, I met Herman, and then I said, Jesus, you know, like, these are heroes. These are gurus, you know, these are amazing human beings that I have a lot to learn from. Dry heaving. I don't smell. That smell like wood to me. Smell, <laughs> smell, smell like this wood. side. I smell like wood to me. It's all it smell like wood. Smell like wood. Smell like wood. Yeah, I think it's this bedroom bigger than my house. Is, is this a bedroom right here? Yeah. It's, it's bigger than, it's, which is all right with me. <laughs> but the bedroom look like a. It looks like it takes up a whole, it's a lot of room. Did you have any idea that it would go to, to this point, this extent when you uh, decided to no. personify, uh, yeah. No way, dude. Like, it was just a game between me and Herman. That's what I thought, you know. Because he was in the dungeon, you know, and mm -hmm. it was just my way of getting Herman out of Angola. And I never expected that I would be in London completely exhausted with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at this point and yeah. trying to build it, you know, and trying mm -hmm. to build his house. originates from a Louisiana correctional facility and may be recorded or monitored. Um, then you want to discuss what you had been doing in reference to the land? I basically have been visiting a lot of properties and on top of everything else, I've decided that it's a really good idea to get a house to live in. And so I went and visited a couple of properties with this realtor and mentioned that we needed a house as well. And the next thing you know, we put in a bid on a house and he was like, oh, that's really low. I don't know if she'll take it. And then he called me at 8.30 this morning to say she took it. So now I'm applying for loans to buy a house in New Orleans. So when do you think this deal gonna fall through? Fall through? I'm hoping it doesn't fall through. No, I don't mean like fall apart. I mean, when are you going to consummate it? When is it going to be final? When is it going consummate? To be final? <laughs> what part you don't understand? You didn't forgot English? Uh, the end of June, Herman, the end of June. Um, the properties that I, that I would love for Herman's house are exactly across the street. And they're owned by the city, and the city's not developing them. I'm so hopeful. I'm really excited. Like in a giddy way. I was even like looking on the ASPCA website to adopt a dog. I'm like, oh my God, I can finally get a dog. <laughs> and maybe recorded or monitored. So now you want a dog. Well, you need one. I need one. In that neighborhood for sure. And I can't wait to have a dog and a house and some property next to the house. Like a little yard so that we could... Uh, you know, have little barbecues and stuff. No, I'm growing up, no, Herman no. Wallace. <laughs> Listen, if you don't get a dog, do yourself a favor. Get a puppy. Get a puppy and raise him yourself. I mean, you get a dog with, with, a, with a history that you don't know anything about your head problem. Mm -hmm. Get a puppy and raise him yourself.
After 36 years in solitary confinement, two of the men known as the Angola Three have been moved into a dormitory with other inmates at Angola. Herman Wallace and Albert Woodfox were convicted of killing a prison guard, but they claim they didn't do it. They have sued the state, claiming cruel and unusual punishment because they've been kept in solitary confinement since the early 70s. It happened um, after 35 years, 11 months, and 7 days in a cell that we were taken from the cell and placed on a bus. And we were bus from the time place all the way out here to Camp D. And, you know, and then they removed all the restraints of, 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 of us, you know, and we walked into the dormitory, and I tell you, it was spectacular. I've been in dormitory before, but it has been, you know, 36 years, and it's just going to take time for me to take and drop a great deal of my defense mechanisms, you know, and uh, blend in with the social activities that's going on around me. It's good, and it, it's preparing me for the street. Okay. Are you with me? I'm with you, yeah. Get my party ready, girl. <laughs> I'm laughing because I've already started. Oh, you've already started. You're so high maintenance, so man. I've got to get the party started. I've got to buy the property. I've got to build the house. All that kind of stuff. I'm all over it. I know you are. I'll do it first. So I like to do one egg, one hand. And then I bang it a little, see how there's a crack? And then I use two hands, pull it apart, and voila. You wanna try? Pick your egg. One egg, one hand. Yes, you can, duty. Woo! You did it the professional way, like way better than me. Go wash your hands, sis. Oh, whoa, I met the Foys because they're our next door neighbors. All right, ready? I call them my kids, definitely. And I don't think, I know their mother doesn't have any issue with me calling them my kids. And that's how I think of them, you know, as very much my children. And that distinction doesn't end with Erica's kids, you know, that like my children are any child that comes into this house and like says I'm hungry, you know. Erica's kids are a really special situation um, because Erica has been doing this on her own. You know, her life partner has been in and out of jail. And so they all end up here at any given time. It's intense and it's beautiful and it's challenging and it's the last thing I ever expected. To have a house, it's awesome. It's actually really nice to have control of my own house as much as you can in a city like New Orleans. And you know, to be able to nest for the first time in 38 years is really amazing and to have a sense of like direction. We got off the phone. There was a rumble going on in the TV room. It got into a fight. 
and one had a broom, and they was wailing at each other, and it caused a great deal of security to come in the dormitory. I'm really worried about it. Like, I want you out of jail. I don't, I think... Listen to me. Listen to me. Come on. I've been in this penitentiary 41 years. All right? I just think you're going to have to sleep at some point, and... I mean, I don't know, Herman. I, I'm really worried about it. I hope you understand, like... You know, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, and and I have the right to voice it. My opinion is is I'm 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 worried about it. Jackie, this is not an op I'm not giving you an opinion. This is not an opinion. It, it's an opinion from your anger. It's not an opinion from my anger. Herman, that's what an opinion is. It's so it's from the person no, 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 no. who's stating its angle. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about what I am what I'm saying or what's coming out my mouth. I'm talking about my actions. That's not an opinion. That's a way of my life here. That's what we're talking this about. This call originates from a Louisiana correctional facility and may be recorded or monitored. That is not an opinion. It's a fact. Herman, I'm talking about your life, too. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's like my fear for your life. And I'm never, ever, ever once going to suggest that I know better than you. I've never been in your shoes. But I am worried about it. This is what I do to make money to be able to work on Herman's house. This is somebody else's shutters that I'm trying to restore. It's my only source of income right now, which is pretty scary, because it doesn't pay that much. It's been a really hard year. To, that's kind of a euphemism. It's been a horrible year. Um, generated by the best intentions. The property across the street, like losing that was really heartbreaking. That was devastating to me because that was more than possible. And that's ideal. <laughs> I was told that it wasn't for sale, and it totally was, and it was for sale during the time that I was looking, and it was totally affordable. I mean, it was completely possible, and it's a huge loss, you know, but maybe it's a loss that means something better will happen. Fine. <laughs> mm. 
there's nothing that has been easy about this, you know. There's nothing that's been easy or systematically logical about building the house for Herman Wallace at all, you know. And so one more wrench in the machine doesn't necessarily mean that it's any less or any more important. And I would build his house if he gets out or not, you know. That's always been the plan. But um, it, it was never my hope that he would have to rely on his house to get out of Angola. My fight was to get him out of Angola. Being in a cage for such an extended period of time, it has this downfall. I mean, you may not feel it, you may not know it, you may think that you're okay, and uh, you just perfunctorily move about, you know, however. When it was removed from out of that type of situation and placed in an open environment where, you know, you're even breathing that oxygen and it's getting into your lungs and you're feeling something, you know, growing within you, and it, you begin to develop a different mold within your body. I even watch my body. I look in the mirror and I've seen muscles and begin to pop out there. I begin to run even faster. And I'm saying, oh, what the hell is going on here? Much was preserved. But then I got locked up again after eight months. And being locked up like that, the whole body just got confused. I'm running behind in my trying to be early schedule, and I need to write down the list of things to talk to Herman about on my arm that I can't forget to ask. Some things more important than others. Uh, I pooped this morning, which is a really good sign because I never poo when I go to Angola because I have so much anxiety. is such a trip. Basically, the only thing on it is vultures for the roadkill. So this dungeon was kind of posh compared to Camp J. It was a much nicer, bigger visiting cell and stuff. And there was only one screen between us, and Camp J there's three. So we started talking about some heavy and arguing. And you know, Herman, as he would, got up on his pulpit and started lecturing me about the death penalty and yada yada. And then I proceeded to get up on my pulpit and lecture him about the death penalty and yada yada. <laughs> I was actually preaching, if you want to use those words, you know. And um, I began to dehydrate. I began to really fall apart. He said, yeah, I'm sweating. And so he went and he banged on the door and said, give me some water, give me some water with ice, you know. And then turned back around and I was like, Herman, Herman, are you okay? I was like, come on, Herman, come on, stay with us. And he would look up and then look back down. And then I was like, and I turned around and I was like, open the door. Like we were just screaming. He's obviously having a stroke. Something is obviously happening to him. Before I completely went out, I was able to hear them banging, banging on the damn screen, screaming and howling, beating on the doors, you know, and trying to get some help. And I knew that they were there for me at that moment. 
You know, it was real. Okay, they opened both doors so there was air coming through. And when they did that, Herman kind of like woke up and he said, I feel, I feel better. I have never felt so powerless in my life, you know. Like, I just wanted to get there, you know. And, and there was no way. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. But, you know, I take it back to what, what I've been through and what I've been going through. I mean, if you stay in a pilot for such a long period of time, you, you get to a point where you don't even smell it. That's not to say that it's not there. You know, in the same way you like, you prepare yourself always assuming that your parents are gonna die before you. And, and you just kind of carry that throughout life, you know. And, you know, and then when they do die, it's like you never once thought that was gonna happen and it hurts really bad and it sucks. And so I don't think there's any sense in preparing for Herman to die of any, you know, health conditions because he is gonna die at a certain point. And I mean, I don't know how much it changes my concern for him, you know. Of course, he's not gonna die in Angola, you know. You sure about that? Yeah, I'm sure. I've had a dream where I got to the front gate and there's a whole lot of people out there. And you ain't gonna believe this, but I was dancing my way out there. <laughs> I was doing the jitterbug. I was doing all kind of crazy, stupid ass, you know? <laughs> and people was just laughing and clapping and shit, you know, until I walked out that gate. And I remember that dream and I turned around, you know, and I looked and there all the brothers was in the window waiting and Knowing the fifth sign, you know, it was, it's rough, man. It really is, uh, it's so real, you know. Um, I can, I can feel it even now, you know, talking about that. Uh. In Herman's house, you, you never um, see Herman, and I was pretty certain from the beginning that that would be the case because I knew the prison system was not going to grant me access to film to film him because he's just not somebody that whose story they they want to be getting out. Once I realized we were only going to hear him, I thought that we should go all the way. 
let's not pretend that he's available. Because, in, in fact, the film is uh, being about solitary confinement, not seeing the person in solitary confinement reinforces that. It reinforces the fact that we don't have access to him, and he doesn't have access to us. Now, what that meant also is that I was going to make the audience do a little bit of work. And that, you, you know, that's a risk, I feel, in any kind of storytelling and filmmaking. But I felt that, you know, this is really a film about imagination, and it's a really a film about um, dreams and, and people seeing beyond their confinement. So maybe in the same way Herman is imagining, I would put the audience in the same space. The prison system in America is deeply flawed, and we need to change it. But at the same time, we need to use our imaginations. And we need to think imaginatively if we're going to address any of the problems that we have in society. It's not just a matter of dollars and cents and, or, or you know, very kind of hard-nosed politics. We need to actually start imagining what kinds of worlds we want to live in and then see that reflected. When we leave things to experts, when we leave things to those who spend uh, all their time studying something, you're actually losing those imaginative possibilities. Because we're not, when we're in that, when you're doing something day in, day out, all the time, you slowly, your, your views generally get narrower and into and, and more of the minutia. And so I think that we need a broader conversation about the criminal justice system and the prison system in this country. And artists definitely need to be a part of it, but so does just everyone in the general public. Um, because it's definitely not going well. I would love to see um, Herman Freed. You know, that's just, I mean, he's, he's a friend of mine too now. I mean, I've spent years with him and, and, and I really, though the film doesn't focus on his case, they're really just, I just can't imagine him being convicted with the evidence that they convicted with him in 19, they convicted him with in 1972 today. I just can't imagine it. And so now we're in a, I mean, there's no physical evidence. There's no, there's no, his, there's no fingerprints, there's nothing on the weapon. He wasn't even near where the crime happened. But now we're in a position where we, there, it's, the criminal justice system just doesn't want to acknowledge a mistake. Because once you do that, you open up all sorts of, so it's now it's just we're, we're, we're replaying this case that would, in the 70s, took place. And, and it's still being replayed, but it's, it's largely on these procedural details that seem irrelevant to me, but you know, I'm not a lawyer.